Good to see you this morning. I, I just uh, enjoyed reading and going over this, list, this particular chapter. I just found it so exciting. Have you ever had an encounter with God beyond your salvation? I mean, has, has God ever let you know how real He is? I guess all preachers have. I remember a time I was a letter carrier and a very good one in downtown Dallas. And as I stepped off the corner of uh, to cross Main Street at Ackard, I heard this. I want you to preach. Somebody said, was it audible? I said, no, it is louder than that. As God spoke to me directly to that, I, I would suppose most preachers would have that in mind. And another time when I was down here hunting, I used, back in the 60s, I used to come down here and get a lease and hunt deer. And I came down with my brother-in-law and, and some guys that worked for him and you know, you go out, if you deer hunt, you go out in the morning early, then you come back about, you know, nine, 10 o'clock. Then you go out in the, in the evening because that's when they were moving. But my brother-in-law, he was known to take a little beer, know a lot of beer. And the guys with him did. And one day they just got kind of, and the, and the language got bad. So I went out to my blind about 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon and sat there just having a time with the Lord. And I said to the Lord, don't do this. I, Lord, you're in charge of everything. If, if, if I ask you, would you just send out a deer? And hardly had I finished the words when the biggest book I ever saw just came and walked across, but I didn't shoot him. He wasn't there to be shot. God, it's such a thrill to me that God just answered me. And, but I'm a whole lot like Gideon. Now, God, if that was really you. <laughs> if that weren't an accident, if that were really you, I'm going to count to 100 to one from a hundred and I started at a hundred and as soon as I said one, another deer walked out just like that one. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and God was telling this young preacher just out of seminary, I hear you, son. I hear you. I am there. I hear you. I, I, I would hope that sometime in your life and you may have, you have such an experience with God that uh, I've, I've never doubted God in, in my life. I've never even been close to an atheist. But it's great when you hear from him and know you hear from him. There's hardly anything like it. And uh, I still get a thrill in my heart just expressing to you what I felt then. So we, we look at this chapter as he appears to, uh, to Abram in a... It's not the first time that he's appeared, but, but it's an exciting time that he comes to him. After these things, and these things means all that went before, the, the war that, that he had with the kings of the north and the uh, meeting with Melchizedek and, and then coming back, after these things, the word of the Lord. Now, I'm not the scholar that others were, but the word there is important to me. As far as I know, that's the first time that word has appeared as the word. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. A vision is something that you see. If the word came to him in something you see, what would you assume that would be? 
a theophany, an appearance of Jesus. It was in his tent, and this appeared to him a vision, it, a dream. No, because he's going to tell him to get up and get out. And, and he was saying to him, do not fear. Now, I know some of the questions are on, on here, but when do you have fear? It's, it's when the uh, what ifs. What if? What if? The unknown. What if, what if? Now, another thing that he had to fear, and, and God will reveal it, he had just won a great battle with some guys and ran them off. What if they reformed and got reinforcements? and came back down. I mean, and he was in a land that all by himself with God, that everything was against him except God. It was really all he had, and, and I think God is going to remind him of that. Don't fear. Do, don't fear. This is the first time this is, is fear has appeared before, or uh, Adam feared, and others, but this is the first time that God said, do not fear. Stop being afraid at Aram, Abram, Aaron, where they, Abram, I am a shield to you. What is a shield? It's protection. It's protection. Those guys can't touch you. If, if, he's talk, if, if his fear was over the battles that he had won and then the possibility of their return, they can't touch you. Now, when we read in the scripture, shields, Romans had the little ones and they had big ones, big as the body. But God's shield is how big? <laughs> when God puts a shield over you, what can touch you? Nothing, nothing. So what are you saying to them? I am a shield. I am your covering. Nothing can happen to you. He, he could say, Abram, don't you remember we've had this talk before? I'm a shield to you and your reward will be great. And, and so he said, I'm not only a shield, I am your complete provision. I've got it covered. Everything you need, I am. I am, he said, I am. And we hear that often, and that's, and that's great. And Abram said, and, and Abram, sometimes we look at these guys and we think, they are such heroes and they're so far above us. No, they're just human. They're just human fighting everything we fight. There is God, but we still live in a world of problems and troubles and, and enemies. And, uh, and he kept thinking about the promise God had made to him about heirs and all of that. But he, but he said, Lord God, oh Lord God, Yahweh Adonai, God my master, what will you give me since I'm childish? You made a promise, but I'm starting to get old. And Sarah's never been any help. <laughs> what will you give me? I, I don't have a child. And, and you talk about a lot of things like this. And the heir to my home, and I'm, I'm out reading out the American Standard, uh, and and our version of that would be, he was adopted. He was a son of, for inheritance. He was an adopted one. If I die, everything we have goes to Eliezer. And I don't see him in, in your promise, but that's as close as I've got. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, 
this man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. Then he took him outside. Apparently they were, uh, when, we, when we think of a, of a dream vision, we would think he would awake. No, no, he took him outside. Somebody took him outside. I'm seeing, I am seeing an appearance of Jesus here in, in, my own, in my own heart and mind. He took him outside. And said, look to the heavens. Now, apparently it was daytime, but what's up there in the heavens? And you know it day and night. It's full of what? Stars, stars full of stars. I guess 30 or 40 years ago, uh, it, some guys thought they had counted all the stars. But they keep appearing, don't they? The light of a star appears. How many, how many new ones every night? <laughs> and, and it's, they're uncountable. Millions, billions. And we're just talking about one galaxy, one solar system. Now, count the stars. And I'm sure Abram said, ah, uh, that's what, I, that's what I would have said. Uh, if you're able to count them, so shall your seed, your descendants be. Now, uh, let, me, let me ask you. Who are his descendants? Who are his descendants? What's he talking about? You're talking about the Jews, of course. But he's talking about the Christ followers. Thank you. That's a great word. He's talking about all the Christians. Let me ask you, how many Christians are there in our world? How many people in our world? Six, Six seven billion, somewhere in there. How many Christians would there be? A bunch. How many have there ever been? Only God knows, but a bunch, a bunch. In no, you can't number them. It's just impossible to number them. That's, that's what this is about. The dust of the earth or the stars of the sky, they're in, you just can't number them, but it simply means more than you can imagine. So shall your descendants be. Verse 6 is one of the most delightful verses in all of Scripture. Then he believed in to the Lord. And the Lord reckoned to him what? Righteousness. Righteousness. He imputed to him. He counted to him. He reckoned. He gave him righteousness. Why? Exactly right, exactly right. For some reason unknown to me, Dale may know, but for some reason unknown to me, the Greek word pastio means faith. But the Greek word pastio also means belief, right? It means allegiance. Allegiance, but belief. And when it's a verb, it's belief, and when it's a noun, it's faith. But they're, they're the same, but belief means really a closeness, an allegiance, a tightness, an inseparableness. He, he, he just counted himself inseparable now from the Lord, and the Lord imputed to him righteousness. Was he righteous personally? Are you? <laughs> every now and then, every now and then, when I'm teaching, I really am. But <laughs> now, 
Righteousness is something God has to give you. God counts you as being right, whether you are or not. Uh, I mean, act, action wise, God counts you. He imputes it to you. I heard that one time in a courtroom. I got to take, when I moved to California, I got to take it and I'll go into what it was. But I, I decided to go to court and I went to court and talked about, and the judge asked me, and I said, guilty with a lame excuse. I moved here from Texas. I was going. I thought I was keeping the law, but California law is different. And the judge said to me, okay, I'm going to do this. If you don't get another ticket in a year, I will not impute this to your sentence, to you. I will not charge you with it. Impute means something you are given that you don't deserve, but you're given because of something you do. And what you do is believe or line up with God. And I love that word allegiance, Dale. Believe, which is faith into God. And then he says, okay, I'm counting you as what? One of mine. I see you as righteous. Whether you are physically or not, I see you that way. Why the unrighteousness of you is taken away. When did that happen? When did your unrighteousness disappear? Christ covered your unrighteousness. Your unrighteousness is your sin, is your life before him, which was, you, you may have said, I know God and I, I like God, but then when you believed in Jesus, now he believed in the Lord. What did he believe in, really? He believed that God would be faithful. He believed in the promises of God. Do you know we're saved the same way? What we give ourselves to has not happened. That is Christ coming for us. But I believe in the written word. That's what God asked me to do. And the written word promises that if I will believe in him, I'll be saved. Boy, that's a great thing. Let me, let, me, let me share one more incident in my life that this just comes alive. When I was a pastor in, in Fresno, there was a particular man, his first name was Herman, a wife, three kids. Herman was a timid guy to everyone else, but abusive to his family, verbally abusive to his family. He would bring his family to Sunday school and often I would meet him at, at there and say, Herman, you ought to come on in and work. No, I'm not dressed, you know. And, and, I, and he would avoid me like a plague anytime. And, but Herman chewed tobacco. And one day his wife called me and said, Herman is in the hospital. He has cancer in his face. And they have removed part of his face, part of his jaw, his skin and all. Uh, I, I didn't know he was even ill, but she told me that. So I immediately went to the hospital and talked with him and go in the room and without this, his breath, it was just such a stench. But Herman was as lost as, as he could be. So I sit down with him and he's going to listen now. And I shared with him the plan of salvation and uh, said to him, Herman, if you will trust in Jesus, God's promise to you is you will be saved and you can go to heaven. You're going to die. The cancer had spread. You're going to die. And so if you will trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to squeeze my hand. 10 seconds went by and I thought it was like an hour and suddenly he squeezed my hand. The great part was, it was on a Wednesday. The great part was when Wednesday night came and his wife came to church, she was smiling from ear to ear. 
And she said, when I went to see Herman tonight, to today, the first thing he said is, I became a Christian today. He believed in the promise of God. That saves us. That's a tremendous thing. Not a small thing at all. He believed in the Lord. And that's all God asked us to do. Oh, I'd like to serve him. I'd like to be much more, wouldn't you? I really would like to be. But all he asked is this. And then anything we do, we are his workmanship. Then we go to work for him as best we can after that. Verse six to me is one of the most beautiful verses in all the scripture. He believed in the Lord and the Lord said, you're righteous. Boy, that's, that's us. That's a tremendous thing to me. And then he said, I, I want to remind you, Abram. He said to him, I am the Lord. I am Adonai. I am the no, Lord is always Yahweh, right? Lord generally is translated, Yahweh is translated Lord. I am the L-O-R-D, capital L, who brought you out of her in the Chaldees. I want you to remember that. To give you this land to possess it. And he said, now, God, how am I to know how I shall possess it? He didn't own, he didn't own anything uh, as far as land is concerned. And so verse 9, God said, bring me a three-year-old heifer. What color do you suppose it was? Red, red. A three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. All these Levitically will be sacrificial animals, animals that can be sacrificed. Now, let me back up here for a moment. Abram built altars, right? I read his whole life. I do not read any one time where he made a sacrifice on that altar. But I believe he did. I believe he did. Bring these and we're going to make a sacrifice. So he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. Didn't cut up the birds, but he put one on, on each side. And, and there you are. That's a sacrifice. Now, apparently this was a custom of the day where if you and I had a disagreement or we were going to make a pact together, we would sacrifice an animal, slice it, appear in, in, in between it, and we would say, I'm going to keep this covenant. If I don't, may what happened to these animals happen to me. That's the purpose of the death of the animals. Let me, uh, let me read from you in uh, Jeremiah chapter 34, verses 18 and 19. The Lord says, I will give the men who transgressed my covenant, who have not fulfilled the words of the covenant, which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between its parts. And the officials of Judah and officials of Jerusalem, the court officers, the priest, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. And he said, God said, I will give them to the hand of their enemy and to the hand of those who seek their life and their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. In other words, if you make a covenant like that and don't keep it, death, death. So God said, here's the covenant. Put those animals aside. We're going to make a covenant. No, he never used the word we. Now, when he did this, verse 11 says, birds of prey came down to him and, and, he, and he fought them off, drove them away. Which tells us it doesn't solve every problem. 
And it may not happen immediately. It's going to take effort on our part to be the guy that needs to receive the thing. I, I see him doing something as best he can to, to make this covenant a reality. And I, I guess Abram thought he would be the one to walk through it with God. But, but he, had, he had to fight off the other thing in order to keep it alive. And verse 12 says, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. I, that's a mystery to me. You, you may can explain it, but I tried to find out over and over what was this. Was it death? Was it Satan? behind the scenes, oppressing, I, I honestly do not know. But a great darkness fell upon him. And God said to him in, in his darkness, know for certain that your seed, your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. There they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. What's he talking about now? Your descendants. How many went to Egypt, remember, when they first went down? About 70, wasn't it? Wasn't it 70? When they came out, how many were there? At least three quarters of a million, maybe maybe a million, maybe more. But that's that's his seed. That's the that's the one he's talking about. But he's telling him they're going to go to this land. They're going to be enslaved, oppressed, and enslaved. And when they come out, they'll have many possessions. What they come out with? Jewelry, jewelry, Everything, all the treasures of Egypt. You take this and go. Take it and go. We're paying you to get out of here. We don't like what happened to us because of your presence here in the last few days. Then in the fourth generation, they, re they will return where? What's the word? Here. Where is here at the time? Canaan. They will return to Canaan. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Amorites were, were always oppressing the Jews uh, any, anywhere you find them, despite the fact that um, uh, a guy by the name of, uh, uh, what's his name, Eskal, and another buddy, Enon, were helping him. But the Ammonites as a people were against them. But as for you, Abram, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried at a good old age. How old was Abram when he, Abraham when he died? 175 years old, which meant he spent one century with God. He was 75 years old when he, when he started out. They return here and the iniquity is not complete. And it came about when the sun set, it was very dark and there appeared. Now remember, he is there. The sacrifice is there. It's in the night. And there appeared to him a smoking oven and a flaming torch passed between these pieces of animals. Who would that be? Who would that be passing between those eyes? Who would the flaming torch and the flax be? It's God. God is saying to Abraham, this is on me. You're not here to keep a promise. You're not here to make a promise. You're here 
or promise to be kept. And that's the way God deals with us. We are alive because of his promises. Listen, don't make promises to God. <laughs> Have you ever? <laughs> Time or two I've said, God, if you'll do this, I'll do that. You ever said that? <laughs> it doesn't mean much. Yeah, it does. It means nothing. God's promises are what counts, not yours. So it came about that there appeared smoking oven and a flaming torch. What does this mean? What? I'm open here. That's a symbol of the cloud and the fire that went before them, leading them out of Egypt. Of the uh, she's kind of glory yeah. of God, and the torch is the fire and the presence of God. The way I, that's the way I see it. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. You could even say he made a covenant for Abram because Abram did not walk between, only God did. He made a covenant saying, to your seed I've given this land from the river of Egypt to the great rivers for the Euphrates. And then he mentioned all the people that live in, in that land, Canaanite, Canaanite, Cadmonite, Amorite, Canaanite, Girgashite, Jebusite, Mosquitobite. <laughs> all, live, all live there and cover, it covered that land. But he said, this land is going to belong to you. What do you mean? Your people. In 1948, the Jews suddenly had a land they could come to. A little bitty land. Nothing like that. But when the Lord comes back, it sets up a reign. I'm a millennialist. You may not be and it doesn't matter. Because God has a plan. And Jesus rules this. The Jews will have that land that is theirs. Completely, all of it, the, the whole size of it will be theirs. That is the promise of God. Now, does God keep his promises? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's pretty well what I have in this chapter. I think it's an exciting thing, or it is to me as I studied it. Boy, my heart just beat. I just enjoyed it so much in this and saw so much. Maybe, maybe I saw more that was in it, and yet I think there's so much in it I never saw. But we'll talk about that again. Rise up, the Lord is calling. Rise up, this is.